YouTube live. Good morning and welcome to Chai and Y on the first Sunday of December. December is the month in which the Nobel Prizes for the year are awarded. And we always have sessions that explain the science and the people and the stories behind the Nobel Prize. And these sessions are exclusively done by students in the TIFR system. So we're gonna kick off today with the Nobel Prize in Physiology slash Medicine. And uh, two weeks from now on uh, December 19th, we will have the uh, one of the, the, the physics prize. And then again, we're going to actually have a special session this month on December 26th as well, where we will cover the chemistry and part of the physics prize as well. So there's going to be a lot of exciting stuff happening at Chai and Y uh, this month, uh, all online. Uh, we are still, well, we were hoping we would be back in our physical venues in January. But as you know, there is the uh, Omicron variant, variant and lots of other uh, uh, constraints still in place. So we will let you know the moment we get permission, we would love to be live and have an audience. Till then, remember, if you're watching us on uh, Zoom or Facebook or YouTube, the only way we can interact with you is via a chat. So please remember to put in your comments, your feedback, your questions, put it in the chat, and we will definitely take them up. With that, uh, let's get started with today's session. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Simran Verdi. She is a integrated PhD scholar at uh, the National Center for Biological Sciences, NCBS in Bangalore. Uh, Simran comes from Faridabad. She did her bachelor's in biomedical sciences at Delhi University. And after that joined NCBS for an integrated PhD program. So she works in the lab of Sanjay Sane where she does some really cool stuff looking at sensors that in a leg of a moth and uh, trying to figure out uh, what happens there. But today she's actually gonna tell us of a different kind of sensing and uh, lets me hand it over to her. It's gonna be some really hot stuff. So tune in and remember to type in your, your, your questions. Okay, over to you, uh, Simran. Let me just spotlight your uh, uh, video. Yeah, you're spotlighted. You can share your screen and uh, uh, do let us know by chat if there are any problems with the audio, video, etc. Uh, we'll try and fix it. Okay. Thanks, Arna. Um, uh, it's uh, I'm really happy to be presenting the uh, work of Nobel Prize winners Ardham Patakutin and David Julius today. Uh, I hope you're all having a good Sunday morning. Uh, so let's get started. So I want to start my talk with a question. Have you ever wondered how humans are able to play sports? What is it about us that allows us to do uh, such an interaction with our environment? We need to uh, take a lot of sensory information from our environment and we need to respond to it. So let's think about these uh, table tennis players. They have to see the ball that's coming towards them. Uh, and in response to that, they have to uh, move so many muscles in their body, in their legs, in their arms, uh, they have to control their breathing and they have to predict the trajectory of the ball that's coming towards them and they have to hit the paddle at exactly the right point. And we rely on our, sen on our senses for uh, doing all of this. Um, so we, we use our eyes to see the world. And when we do that, the light rays that come off, uh, that reflect off of objects uh, enter our eyes and that somehow gets transformed into an image inside our brain. Um, and we, we use the molecules in the air and in food to smell and to taste. And we, uh, the sound waves that travel through the air um, are sensed by our ears and that gets converted into music. And we use our skin to sense the world through touch uh, and temperature and pain. So, Humans have always been curious about how these senses really work. How do light rays get converted to images in our brain? Um, and 
so we know that this year's Nobel Prize one uh, went to the research that was done on one of these senses, which is uh, our sense of touch. Um, but uh, this is not the only Nobel Prize that has been awarded uh, to work done on our primary senses. And Ken, can you all guess how many Nobel Prizes have been received so far um, by scientists who have worked on these senses? So you can uh, type in your guesses in the chat and uh, I will re re reveal the answer in a bit. Okay, so do put it in the chat. How many Nobel Prizes for uh, work on the sensory, our five senses? Of course, you know, we know one this year, yeah. this year, but how, before that, how many, or you know, totally how many Nobel Prizes have been given? Okay, come on, please use the chat. Let me open the chat window. Is it five? Is it four? Is it one? Is this the first Nobel Prize that went to our senses? Okay, Anshul says two. Come on, somebody else. Girish says five. Um, okay. Who else? Who else? Come on, take a guess. How about some numbers between the two of them? <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, maybe you should you should tell us what the answer is. Okay, so the answer Three, is yeah. okay. Okay, so the answer is four. Um, so in addition to the uh, Nobel Prize of this year, uh, in 1961, one Bekasi won the Nobel Prize for uh, his work on hearing, uh, and six years after that, George Wald won the Nobel Prize for his work on vision. Uh, in 2004, Richard Axel and Linda Buck won the uh, Nobel Prize for improving our understanding of how our olfactory system, our nose works. And of course, this year, David Julius and Adam Pataputin won the prize uh, for their work on temperature sensors and pressure sensors. Okay, so when I say temperature sensors and pressure sensors, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? I'll give you a hint. This is also the largest organ of a body. So I think you all guessed it, right? It's our skin. And let's, uh, let's take a moment to appreciate everything that we can sense through our skin. It is our first line of defense. And it makes sense that we acquire a lot of information about our environment through our skin. We can sense touch. Uh, we can feel the prick of a needle, which causes pain. We can sense uh, the temperature around us, be it hot or cold and we can feel pressure. So there you have it, pressure, touch, cold, hot, and pain. And the reason why pain is uh, so such a, in, in such a big font in this slide is because today's story really starts with pain. So David Julius has been interested in pain for a long time. He was born in New York in 1955. Uh, he finished his bachelor's at MIT in 1977. After that, he went on to do a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and he finished his PhD in 1985. Uh, after his PhD, he did a postdoctoral fellowship at Columbia University with Richard Axel, and Richard Axel is the same person who won the Nobel Prize in 2004. Um, and after that, he started his own lab uh, at University of California, San Francisco in 1989. And just uh, seven years after, eight years after he started his lab, he published the, the first really important paper that I will be talking about that uh, started, uh, started him on his journey towards the Nobel Prize. So uh, before I tell you why Ju uh, David Julius was interested in pain, uh, I need to tell you a little bit about our skin. So when you cut, our, when you cut your skin and you look at it from the side, uh, you see, three layers. The topmost layer, epidermis, is where is the layer that we can see and touch. But beneath it is the layer called dermis, where all our sensory neurons are present. And all the different uh, uh, senses that I talked about, uh, touch, cold, pain, they're all sensed by different kinds of neurons. But how do neurons sense anything? How do neurons really work? So uh, this is a neuron. And if you zoom into uh, a small part of the neuron. Uh, uh, so neurons have sensors on their surface, just like we have sensors on our surface. Uh, it's a crude analogy. 
uh, but it helps you imagine how it works. So on the surface of neurons sits uh, receptors, which are sensors, uh, and these receptors bind to molecules, which makes them active. So in the case of our sense of smell and our sense of taste, where molecules are involved, uh, the molecules that come from food, like sugar molecules, or the molecules that are in the air, like uh, the coffee aroma, these molecules bind to these uh, receptors on the su uh, surface of neurons, and they uh, the receptors get activated. In turn, uh, so uh, these receptors have a pore inside them, and that pore opens up, and this allows ions from the surrounding fluid of the cell to go inside the cell, and this activates the cell itself, uh, the neuron, and the neuron fires. Um, and this is how neurons act like on and off switches where uh, the presence of this molecule in this purple, the shown, shown by that purple square, uh, activates the neuron by binding to this receptor. And receptors are uh, proteins, uh, but I will talk more about that later. So uh, this explains how um, our sense of smell and our sense of taste works because molecules are involved. But what about our sense of touch and pressure and um, uh, temperature and pain? Because touch is not a molecule that can come and bind to a receptor. And pain is a mystery. We don't know how pain, we, we didn't know how pain works. Um, and there's still a lot of unanswered questions about how pain works. But we, we are really interested in pain because of uh, one, it, it is something that is very essential to our survival. So if you can't feel pain, um, your body can't protect itself. For example, if you step on a nail, uh, you will feel pain and you will step away from it before it can cause more damage. Pain is a, uh, is, is, some, is a signal that our body gives us to tell us that something is wrong and we need to take care of something. But some people experience pain for no reason. There are medical conditions where uh, there is chronic pain, which is which uh, there is no known reason of. Though, so the doctors can't figure out why this pain uh, exists in these patients, and the treatment becomes very difficult. So David Julius was interested in pain, and another interesting thing about pain uh, uh, neurons, the pain sensitive neurons, is that uh, it's they are somehow. So the pain is somehow related to something that we eat. So there's a chemical in uh, uh, chili peppers called capsaicin, which activates the same neurons that sense pain. And this is, uh, this is, a this is an example in biology where an unexpected connection uh, is made between something that is sensed like pain and something that we eat. And David Julius realized that this connection can be used to understand how pain works because um, so here is a molecule uh, which must be binding to a receptor on the pain neuron surface. And if we can figure out how this receptor works, we can sort of come a little closer to understanding how pain works. And if we can figure, if we, if we find out this receptor, another thing we can do is we can uh, figure out ways to control this neuron. We can find medicines that uh, act on this receptor uh, inactivated and uh, cause the pain neurons to stop firing in patients uh, in which the these neurons fire for no reason. So the real question that uh, Julia sought out to answer with the students was, what is the capsaicin receptor? So uh, uh, a quick question: In you know you showed the picture of the dermis. Are there separate neurons for pain and touch and all those things? Or is it like the same neuron and these different ends of it have different uh, receptors for different things? Or uh, are they separate neurons? So uh, these are, uh, so there are separate uh, neurons that sense pressure, touch, cold, hot, pain. And uh, they, they are all, uh, so we call, we call this a labeled line system. Um, yeah, so th they are separate neurons. Uh, okay, so, so they are separate neurons. All right. Yeah. So here you can see that they look different as well. Uh, the pain, the pain sensitive neurons look like this, and the pressure sensitive neurons look like this. So we know how these neurons look, but we don't really know how they work um, at the receptor level, the the, the receptor in the on the uh, neuron surface. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, to figure out uh, something about uh, the pain neurons, uh, it, it's a good start to know where they are located in our body. Uh, so all the neurons that, uh, are, that take information from our skin, they go to our spinal cord via this, this uh, bulb-like structure called the dorsal root ganglion. Uh, and this is where you can, uh, you can find all the neurons clubbed together. So we know that some of these neurons uh, are the ones that are sensitive to pain. So the question is, which of these, so you have to find those neurons within the dorsal root ganglia, which is sensitive to pain, so that you can uh, figure out what is the capsaicin receptor. So um, one way to figure out the, what the receptor is, to take all the receptors that are expressed by uh, cells in the dorsal root ganglion and put them in non-neuronal cells. So these are not sensory cells, these are some other cells. But if you put the receptor in these cells, they might become uh, sensitive to, to that particular uh, molecule that they sense. But you can't just take receptors out of one cell and put it in another because a receptor is a protein and uh, this is something which, is, which just can't be done. But this is where um, a fundamental concept in biology comes to the rescue, which is called the central dogma. So all proteins are made by, um, are, are, uh, proteins have, proteins are made by the information that is stored in our nucleus, which is, uh, which is in the form of the DNA. Um, so there's a raised hand. Should I take the question or, I know. We'll wait. I mean, if you raise your hand, you want to ask a question, we'll allow it later. Right now, if you have an urgent question, Ambuch, please put it in the chat and we'll take it up. Okay. Uh, because I can unmute you later at the end. No problem. Uh, uh, there is a thing on the chat. Uh, is it the same receptor which changes itself according to the receiving molecule? Or I think there are different receptors. Uh, that's a question on the so uh chapter. receptors uh, so if if by this you mean that the receptor pore opens in response to the molecule that binds it uh yeah so we are assuming that capsaicin is one such receptor and now we're trying and uh, and now they are they, that's what they assume and then they try to figure out uh what is the receptor and how does it work um I hope that answered the question. So, so there are different receptors for specific molecules. That's the answer. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Go ahead. Go ahead. Continue. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no worries. So uh, the information that makes proteins is stored in the DNA. Uh, and from the DNA uh, to protein, uh, on the way, we, uh, the cells make something called an mRNA, which where M stands for messenger. So mRNA is basically a molecule that takes information from the DNA uh, so that it can be converted into a protein. So it's an intermediate molecule. Um, and uh, to give you an example of what proteins really are and what they do, uh, proteins are the workhorses of cells and they do all the work. And uh, one of the uh, really popular examples of proteins is hemoglobin, uh, which is uh, a protein found in our uh, red blood cells, which uh, carries oxygen uh, from our lungs to different parts of our body. Um, and we all know hemoglobin because you get tested for it. Right. So the protein that we are interested in is uh, the capsaicin receptor. And because we can't take the protein itself, uh, what Ju David Julius and his group started doing was they took the mRNA. So there are all these cells in the dorsal root ganglion and they extra uh, extracted the mRNA that these cells were uh, making, uh, the nucleus of these cells were making these mRNA. Um, and so now they have a library of all the mRNAs that they got. And this library, they divided into small, small chunks called pools. And these are the pools that they uh, uh, put into these non-neuronal cells. Uh, and one by one, and then they tested whether this uh, uh, RNA that they now put, um, this genetic material that they now put into these non-neuronal cells, did it make it? Uh, did it make these cells uh, responsive to capsaicin? So uh, one such pool worked uh, when they uh, put this pool in, in cells, and then they gave the cells capsaicin. Uh, the cells showed activity. 
which means that they were uh, uh, responding to the to capsaicin and capsaicin was binding to uh, the receptor which was now on the surface of these cells uh, and this is uh, their uh, data from the figure uh, from the paper that they published in nature in 1997 uh, uh, he david julius worked with his student katerina uh, to do this work uh, so on the left panel you can see these blue dots uh, which are cells that they put the, put this genetic material in and when they gave capsaicin to these cells they showed activity which is visible uh, as green and yellow uh, change in color from blue so now they have uh, now they figured out that giving this dna to the uh, two cells can make it responsive to capsaicin um, but let's remember that what they really wanted to understand was pain. So they thought, okay, so what are the other stimuli that induce pain? And heat is one of them, because if you touch something which is, uh, which is burning hot, you will feel pain. So then they tried to, uh, they took these same cells and instead of giving them capsaicin, they uh, heated them up and they saw activity in the same cells. So um, now we know the capsaicin receptor, which also makes uh, cells sensitive to heat. So, um, and we know what mRNA uh, made this possible. So they went back to that mRNA and uh, they figure, and from that mRNA sequence, which is basically information, they figured out the protein that would uh, uh, be getting made inside the cells and using softwares and bioinformatic tools and uh, protein structure. Uh, uh, so this is in the field of uh, understanding how proteins uh, are structured. Um, they figured out what the protein would uh, might look like. And they also imaged this uh, and figured out the structure of the protein. So here is an animation to show you what the protein looks like. Uh, it's a 3D animation where you will see uh, this capsaicin molecule, which is coming and binding. Uh, so this is the cell membrane in yellow. In purple is the protein, which, it's, uh, which is called TRPV1, TRPV1. Uh, capsaicin is bound to the receptor and the receptor is now open. And the ions from outside the cell are allowed inside the cell. And this makes the neuron active. And when you heat the cell up, the same thing happens. The pore opens up and ions are allowed in. So this is a protein where, uh, which is getting active, which is uh, allowing the pore to open up, not just by the binding of capsaicin, but also uh, uh, because of heat. So people used to think before that heat is sensed by neurons because it damages the cell uh, surface. But they showed for the first time that the cell surface is not damaged. What actually happens is that there is a protein there which changes its conformation in, in, uh, because of heat. Uh, and this is how heat is actually sensed. And this receptor is the same as the receptor that senses uh, capsaicin in chili peppers, which, which makes sense because when you eat something which is uh, spicy, you feel, uh, you feel this heat in your mouth. And it uh, turns out that they're related at the molecular level. So this uh is Simran, there are two questions which I'd like to take here. So one is, uh, you showed this uh, little image of blue cells and something lighting up with uh, with capsaicin, right? Yeah. Um, so the question is from, uh, where is the question gone? Yeah, Anshul is asking, how are these, are these images showing the thermal activity or is this some fluorescence or what are you seeing here? Yeah. This, uh, things which are lighting up. So they are, they, it's not a temperature difference, right? No, this is not a heat map. So the cells, um, to to see to see the activity of the cells, uh, they put a calcium sensor in the cells, uh, which would uh, turn on a fluorescent molecule. So um, this is actually fluorescence that you are seeing. So it's okay. it's, uh, it's an indicator that the cell is active, and uh, it's fluorescence that you can see under the microscope. Okay, and uh, Bhuvan, I don't know. Uh which, what level you are at. I think he has a question on that central dogma slide. What are euka eukaryotic cells? Okay, so uh, uh, the uh, the kingdom of life is divided into uh, eukaryotic. Uh, so eukaryotic cells are um, cells which have a nucleus which is uh, bound by uh, a nuclear membrane. 
uh, and we are we have eukaryotic cells so eukaryotes are uh, most of uh, are all the organisms uh, apart from bacteria and uh, are archaea um okay so okay so, great so, yeah, yeah go ahead is that our cells are eukaryotic Okay, great. Okay, Go so ahead. so to summarize, uh, what David Julius did was he took cells which were not inherently uh, responsive to capsaicin because they did not have that receptor, uh, and he um, figured out which uh, giving them which DNA fragment makes them responsive to capsaicin. So this is this is uh, an example of uh, a gain of function experiment where you take something which does not have the function that you wish to study and you give it that function. And in doing so, you understand something about how, uh, the, the, pro the phenomena that you're trying to study works. And in this case, this was, uh, it was, uh, pain and capsaicin and heat. Um, and this is the sensor that I showed you in the animation trip V1. Uh, it is closed at normal temperatures, but open at high temperatures. Um, it's also open when capsaicin binds to it. And after, after discovering this receptor, he went on to discover many others uh, using the same pipeline of experiments. Um, and he also discovered TRIP-M8, which is a receptor that's uh, responsive to cold uh, and menthol, which again makes sense because when we eat menthol, we feel uh, we feel cold in our mouth. Okay, so David Julius showed us that there is a connection between heat and pain. Um, and uh, this works through a receptor which binds to capsaicin. But we still uh, have a lot of unanswered questions about, uh, the, about how touch and pressure work. So, uh, so if a receptor can be opened with heat, can a receptor be opened by touch? And this is the question that Adam Pataputian really wanted to answer. Um, he was born in Beirut in Lebanon, and he went to University of California, Los Angeles, where he completed his bachelor's degree in 1990. He finished his PhD from uh, California Institute of Technology uh, in 1996. Um, his postdoctoral fellowship was at RICAD at uh, was with RICAD at UCSF. Uh, this is the same uh, university where um, David Julius has his lab, San Francisco. Um, and Padaputin started his own lab at Scripps Research Institute um, in 2000. So, uh, what David Julius did was he took cells which were not responsive to capsaicin and he made, made them responsive to capsaicin. But what Adam Patiputin did was he first found the cells which were responsive to uh, touch on their own. Uh, and he did this by uh, testing a whole bunch of cells in the laboratory uh, by, taking, by putting those cells under a microscope uh, and poking them with a, a very thin probe and at the same time, uh, he measured the electric electrical activity inside these cells uh, with, the, uh, uh, with an electrode. Uh, and he did this for many, many uh, cell lines. Uh, cell lines are uh, uh, cell cultures that we use in, our, in, in the lab to understand, uh, uh, to understand, to ask a whole range of questions about biology of cells, of organs, et, et cetera. Um, and he found one cell line <clears throat> which was responsive to mechanical force. Um, <clears throat> and so now uh, he has already figured out, okay, these cells are responsive to mechanical force. Now the question is, what, did it, what is it in, in these cells that makes them responsive to <clears throat> mechanical force? Um, and so let's go back. A quick question, that. Simran. Are these all skin cells that he took? Cells from the dermis, or are these some different cells? No, these are uh, neuronal cell lines. Uh, they're okay, not neurons. Okay. Yeah, they're not necessarily from the skin. Uh, I will, I will uh, remember this question and answer this later. Um, yeah, I, I'll uh, come back to it. Okay, so uh, he figured out which cell line is responsive to mechanical force. Now let's go back to the central dogma. Uh, it is very likely that these cells are making a protein 
uh, which sits on the surface of these cells, which is making them responsive to um, the, the mechanical force. So now to figure out which protein it is, okay, so because, because these cells are making this um, mechanoreceptive uh, mechano protein, um, they must be making the mRNA, which makes this protein, right? Because that's the first step. So one way to understand uh, what is the sensor on the skin uh, on the uh, uh, cell surface, which is making it uh, mechanosensitive, uh, which is responsive to touch, is to uh, figure out what mRNA uh, is making that receptor. So what they did was they extracted the RNA out of the cells. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, no, they did not extract iron out of these cells. They they already had candidates of uh, MR, uh, RNA, which might be making this uh, receptor, uh, the touch receptor. So what they did was they blocked this particular RNA in these cells uh, by a technique called RNA interference. Um, and so they so let's uh, so let's imagine that there were three RNAs that they were testing. Uh, testing for. So they blocked, let's say, the first two RNAs, and that did not change the activity of these cells. So the cells were still responsive to touch. But when they blocked the third RNA, the cells became unresponsive, which means it, it is something about this RNA in particular that makes these cells responsive to touch. And they assumed that this RNA must be making, uh, um, uh, they knew that this RNA was making a protein. And uh, the next thing that they did was they took this RNA and they figured out what protein would it be making uh, using the same tool that David Julius did. Um, and this is, uh, this is the protein that they figured it out to be. And they took images of it. Um, and it looks like it, it is shaped like a fan. So uh, to put things in perspective, hemoglobin is a protein which is made up of 146 amino acids. It's, uh, and, and uh, okay, amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So they are the, uh, they are the building blocks of the chain that is protein and that chain is folded up like the, so that's why it looks like squiggly lines. Uh, in comparison, the piezo one uh, sensor that they discovered um, uh, so PHO stands for pressure and they named it uh, PHO1 and PHO1 and PHO2. So this uh, protein is humongous. It's made up of 2,500 amino acids. So the receptor that they were looking for is not just huge, but it's also fan-shaped. Um, and this is the same receptor in, a, in 3D um where you can see the three arms which look like uh fan blades and there's a central uh, cap and underneath the cap is a pore uh so remember i told you that these uh receptors uh some sometimes have pores inside them which open up and uh this allows ions from outside to go inside and this is what makes the neuron uh, activated so here is an animation to just give you a sense of how this um, receptor would look on the surface of uh, the cell membrane on, on the surface of the neuron. So in uh, this dark purple is the cell membrane and uh, the light purple is the uh, receptor that's, that's floating around in the cell membrane. Okay, so let's imagine that this uh, receptor is uh, on the surface. Simran. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I am looking at the questions that have been coming in. Yeah. And I feel we have a lot of young listeners today. Okay. In fact, Bhuvan has said he's in the sixth standard. Uh, and maybe, maybe you should just go back and spend a minute on your central dogma slide that, uh, you know, you said proteins are the workhorses, but it all starts somewhere with DNA and there's an RNA in the middle and you know, I'm sure people have heard of mRNA vaccines and, you know, whatever these the words, but I, I really don't think people, uh, can, you, can you just spend a minute on this thing about how our, I mean, this is probably the most important thing in understanding biology, right? How proteins are made from the information in the DNA. Uh, so maybe if you can just, just uh, do this one more time uh, so that uh, a lot of people understand what is DNA, what is RNA and uh, how proteins are made. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so that imagine, uh, okay, imagine that um, your cell is a, 
Okay, so the cell is a whole world in itself because it's full of all these different molecules that are doing different things. Uh, but the command center of the cell is the nucleus, um, which uh, which is uh, which has a membrane around it in eukaryotic cells. So inside the nucleus sits DNA, uh, which is um, deo deoxyribonucleic uh, acid. So DNA is uh, what makes. Um, uh, so the human DNA is is what makes us human. So this is the in this is the molecule in which all the information about how to uh, make the cells, how to run the cells, uh, deciding which cell will become which, uh, all of that information is stored. But the DNA can't do anything by itself. Uh, for the D for the DNA to use this information and put it into action, uh, it needs a messenger. So think of the DNA as a king sitting in a castle and to, uh, to do the bidding of the king, you need messengers to take the king's messages outside. Uh, and that is done by, uh, M, uh, that is done by RNA, uh, in particular, the messenger RNA, which takes the instructions from DNA uh, and, then, uh, may, uh, and then allows the machinery of the cell uh, to make proteins out of that same instructions. Uh, and these proteins uh, do a lot of different things. I gave you the example of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is one such protein that gets made uh, in, inside the uh, red blood cells when they, are, when they are getting formed in our body. Um, and proteins uh, also make all the receptors that sit on the surface of the cell. So I talked about the olfactory system where uh, the molecules that uh, we, uh, so, if, if you're smelling coffee, the molecules that are coming off of the coffee into the air, uh, they are binding to a protein uh, on the surface of our uh, sensory neurons inside our nose. So all these, uh, these proteins are what ma make these receptors. Um, and they do a whole, a whole lot of other things as well, uh, but I will not go into that today. Um, Arnab, do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is this is great. So just just you can now go ahead with the second part of, of whatever wherever you are. You had the yeah. The... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I, I hope that explains it to the audience who was asking. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's continue. Okay. Okay. So I showed you this uh, uh, this receptor that they discovered, which looks like a fan. Uh, and now imagine that this uh, fan shaped receptor is is embedded in the surface of the trampoline. So when somebody uh, jumps on the trampoline and it, it gets stretched, um, this receptor, uh, how would this receptor sense that change in the, uh, in the stretch of the trampoline? So uh, it just like the trampoline example I gave you, it sits on the, uh, it's embedded in the membrane of the cell. So the surface of the cell. And uh, when there is no force applied, uh, the receptor sits like this and it's closed, but when um, uh, a mechanical force is applied, so like you push something on the cell membrane, it gets stretched and this opens up the receptor. Uh, by opening up, I mean that the pore which this receptor has in its center gets opened up and all the ions from the uh, surrounding fluid go inside the cell, which makes the cell active. So this is how this uh, mechano uh, this um, mechanosensory uh, receptor on the cell surface works. Um, and here is an animation to show the same thing. Um, so this is the receptor sitting in the closed state uh, and all these ions are floating around uh, outside the cell. And now it has been opened because the membrane was stretched. And now you can see that the ions can go inside. Uh, and now again, it's closed. So this is how the uh, shape of the receptor changes in response to the um, pressure that's applied on the cell membrane. And that's, and it allows, uh, it acts as a switch, which is either in the off position or on position. And that is how it allows the sensory neuron to sense pressure and touch. Okay, so um, so this explains uh, how the sensory neurons in our skin are able to sense uh, the touch or the pressure uh, stimuli. 
but uh, what they found out was that this uh, receptor on this the receptor of the neuron surface is not just present in our skin but it's present in various different parts of our body it's present in the lungs in the heart in our stomach in our urinary bladder and in all these places it senses the stretch which these organs experience so these organs are uh, not solid objects they expand and they contract um, our lungs inflate and deflate our heart pumps blood uh, our blood vessels experience a lot of uh, pressure because our uh, blood is pumped through them at high pressure and then the pressure drops and that is what you measure in in uh, measure in uh, the doctor measures when you go to get your bp checked um and the stomach gets distended when you eat a lot of food so all these things are uh, at the molecular level getting sensed by this one uh, sensor um uh, which is uh, the, the which, which was discovered by adam patakutin um and the sensor is also involved in hearing so uh, in our in our inner ear uh, the cochlear region where uh, the sensory neurons are uh they found that the sensory neurons have the same uh receptor on them which allows them to sense the vibrations in the air which is sound um and amazingly this receptor is also present in uh, our rbcs so our red blood cells are a very particular uh, so there's a very particular volume that they can carry and they have to maintain that volume so um so if the volume changes the cell surface like a blowing a balloon will also experience stretch and uh, pressure uh, and this is where this receptor sits on the uh, red blood cells and it senses all of that so if the rbcs uh, take up too much uh, water and they become big this receptor will sense that and signal for the rbcs to lose water and come back to its original shape um and this is very important in our uh, physiology but they discovered that there are some people who have a mutated copy of this gene a mutated copy of this uh, this sensor so this mutated sensor what it does is uh, this is hyperactive so even if the cells have a normal volume it will signal to the cells that your volume is too high and because of that the cells end up shrinking uh, so this is uh, the rbcs of a person who has this gene mutated um so their uh, their pizza channel is hyperactive and you can see that the rbcs are shrunken in size their volume is uh, less than the rbcs come of a of a normal uh, person of a, of a person who has a normal copy of this protein so a mutated pizza gene makes red blood cells shrink in size so at first glance you would think that um this is a bad thing and it must be causing some some sort of anomaly in the way our body works and this must be leading to a disease uh but the truth is that this is connected to a disease uh yes but not in a bad way um and if you've been following us on twitter uh, etc you you might be able to guess which disease i'm talking about um and i'm talking about malaria so malaria uh, affects uh, a lot of people in the world uh and it's uh, a cause of very high death rates uh but it turns out that people who have this mutated pizza channel in their rbcs uh they are able to uh, uh they are protected from malaria because when rbcs become dehydrated uh the pathogen that causes uh, malaria which is plasmodium is unable to uh, in, is unable to uh, infect these cells so the infection rate drops and they also found that one out of three africans carry this gene uh, which makes them resistant to malaria so when they mutated the same gene in uh, mice they uh, and they studied the brain of these mice they saw that the brains uh, stayed normal as in they did not get affected by cerebral uh, cerebral malaria so this is an example of um research which started out to be very basic the scientists wanted to understand how pain works how touch and pressure are sensed in our cells uh, but it ended up leading uh, into insights about one of the uh, major diseases that uh, our species is combating and 
if if I have to uh, condense this into take home messages from from this talk, um, what David Julius taught us uh, was that chili pepper and burning pain are sensed by the same receptor, which is trip V1. Uh, and Adam Patton Pataputian showed us that sensing hugs is related to protection from malaria through piezo receptors. Um, and this is uh, the su a summary slide where you can see both of their work. Uh, one worked on pressure pressure sensing, which uh, which are different neurons in our uh, skin, and one worked on heat and pain, which are which are sensed by different neurons in our skin. Uh, and these are the receptors that they discovered. And with this, I would like to uh, open the talk for questions. I'll leave you at this at this slide. Okay, thank you so much. That was delightful. I mean, it's just unbelievable how things get connected uh, all the way from trying to understand touch to figuring out the same mechanism is or a mutation is re responsible for shrinking the size of red blood cells and that then helps people not get serious malaria, etc. It's, wow, it's quite amazing. Okay, I'm sure people have a lot of questions. So right now, if you have questions, uh, we can either allow you to unmute and ask, or if you're on uh, YouTube or Facebook, you can uh, just type it in the chat box. So uh, while people think about some questions, let me just check, uh, are there any questions on Facebook perhaps? Uh, nothing yet, okay. So earlier, uh, Ambuj, you had a question. Do you wanna ask that question now or uh, have we got you, got you the answer already? So uh, yeah, if you if you want to if you want to ask a question, you can just raise your hand and we'll we can allow you to ask a question, no problem. Or you can type your question in the uh, box. Let me just go to YouTube and see if there are any interesting questions or comments. Okay, Ambud says he has got his answer, but you can ask another question as well, no problem. Uh, let me just quickly go to YouTube. Uh, there is one comment. I guess it's not a question from Survi who says that there is also a disease where people do not feel pain at all. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Sure. So all goes to say that. Okay. Uh, there's a question which has come, which says, "Why do we need two sensors for hot and cold? Uh, isn't it the same thing? Like hot is, you know, the like cold is the reverse of hot kind of stuff. Why do you have separate sensors for different temperatures?" Okay. So. Um, so the way these sensors which are receptors work is that uh, they have a particular conformation and uh, when a physical stimuli comes like heat this conformation changes so the same receptor cannot be activated by both heat and cold because uh, the, it's it's uh, structure is such that it will only open up its pore when it's hot and not when it's cold uh, and this is important because if we had the same receptor sensing both things uh, then how would you differentiate between the two? Um, and the neurons that tell us that we are touching something hot or touching something cold are different. They are they are separate neurons uh, which have these separate receptors. Um, and and this is why we need. Uh, I mean, this is why we have different sensors which sense different uh, hot and cold. And not just that, uh, even different levels of hot are sensed by different receptors. Okay, so I think that automatically leads to the ne next question uh, from Ranjit, who is asking, how is temperature sensed, uh, the temperature difference or temperature variation? I mean, you know, we can always touch things and we know that, okay, this is hot, warm, cold, whatever. So are there just lots and lots of different sensors for different temperatures or how is temperature sensed? Right. Um, I don't know uh, properly how this works. Uh, but temperature is uh, sensed by these these receptors that David Julius discovered, uh, and uh, as I said before, there are different neurons that sense uh, different uh, temperatures. So, for example, if if I have if I'm touching something which is 37 degrees Celsius, um, some neurons will get activated because they have the sensor which senses 37 degrees. Uh, if I touch 42 degrees another set of neurons will get active because they have the uh, sensor, uh, they have the receptor, which senses uh, 43 degrees uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but the temperature difference, uh, if, if you mean by this, the, um, 
the way we adapt to temperature okay so you all must have experienced this uh, this if you keep touching something hot uh for a long time uh then you uh, don't feel it as hot anymore uh you need to cool your hand down again uh before touching the same thing so that it it seems hot to you uh and this has some and this is a, a phenomena called adaptation and i'm not sure how this phenomena works uh in the case of temperature sensing um but i'm guessing it has something to do with the receptor um yeah but that's all i know uh, for now uh the full form of rna and uh, dna i i could just type it out in the chat yeah, i can put it in the box i can put it in the box okay i've typed out dna and um yeah i think rna is much easier because it's just uh, rna is just the ribo without the d yeah okay um and let's see if there are other questions coming in uh okay there is uh, another question i guess guess you can see the chat as well right yeah uh, so there is i mean of course in english we say that the opposite of pain is pleasure um uh, and is that also a sensory uh, are there sensors and receptors uh so i don't know how to scientifically uh define pleasure um but uh, yeah so they're not so it depends on what you mean by pleasure um if if it is uh for example um something pleasant that you smell then that's completely different but if we're only talking about the sense of touch uh then let's say a handshake is pleasant um and that is sensed again by the piezo receptor because uh you uh it the piezo receptor helps us sense touch and pressure okay the those full forms so piezo is it, not no i i think i i think maybe uh, maybe uh also uh, uh i mean there are there are sensor i mean there are molecules like serotonin and all which uh, for which there are sensors right i mean they they will uh you know okay there yeah. are also molecules that can give us a sense of pleasure but those are those are sort of probably different right yeah those are uh, uh, i think located in our uh, cns the pleasure the uh, for example what is it called the reward pathway when we do something um such as eat chocolate or sugar the reward pathway gets activated and that is uh, led by other i mean that has some other molecules at its center I and mean, you you all must have heard of dopamine and as arna mentioned serotonin and they have similar receptors uh, like the one i described here which sit on the cell surface and they sense these molecules and the neurons get activated okay uh, there is a question on how long does it take for these ion channels etc to open so if you touch something hot you know for just a millisecond or something will it open or a microsecond or something will there be you know could you could you um, the, do these like sensors require some sort of time before it they really react and the whole process happens or is it so fa how fast is it uh so if you touch something very quickly and you remove your hand you sometimes don't feel hot because uh heat hasn't had the uh time to reach your sensors i i am guessing uh, yeah it's like you can put your finger through a candle flame really quickly you know just yeah. put your finger through the candle flame it, you can do it it doesn't yeah so there must be some threshold which is required for the uh, receptor to get turned on so um if you're thinking of heat heat is an energy right so uh think of it as giving energy to the piezo cha piezo channel which makes it open up so i'm guessing there must be a threshold uh, of how much energy it requires for the piezo to open up its pore and in this case the energy is in the form of heat um i don't know the exact time it takes um yeah okay uh, let me just go to youtube and check okay there are a bunch of questions here uh okay um 
Okay, Suravi has a question saying that how are the cells maintained in good condition once they are extracted from an organism? You said you work on these cell lines or whatever outside in the dish. How do they main? How are they maintained outside the organism? Um, so we are given uh, nutrients, um, sugar, and other uh, micronutrients that our cells need to survive. Um, there is salts in the medium in which they are kept. So it is sort of similar to the environment that they are they experience inside our body. Uh, and they also have uh, oxygen pumped into the medium in which they are. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be pumped in. It could just be shaken and then oxygen will keep dissolving in the in the medium that they're in. So they 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 are kept in a medium. Uh, which has all these things which are necessary for their survival. And this is how they keep on living. Um, and uh, the thing that makes cell lines cell lines is that these cells are uh, essentially immortal. So um, they they can keep on dividing in, uh, and they don't grow old and die, uh, basically. So you can keep culturing them in the lab and keep using them for um, understanding uh, biology. Okay, uh, there is another question on YouTube, uh, which is uh, saying that, uh, okay, there is, there is, uh, uh, there is, you said that these sensors were in the heart as well, mm -hmm. uh, these receptors or whatever. Uh, is it, you know, is there any heart disease caused by that? Uh, uh, not that I know of, but maybe if i search i'll find something uh, okay. but so, uh, so there are the receptors that are in the blood vessels um, they sense the blood pressure um, and we don't know whether people who have a high blood pressure uh, have a problem with these receptors uh, because these receptors help modulate the blood pressure of uh, uh, of the body uh, I, do, I don't know if there have been any studies on that, but that is uh, a good question to ask. Um, okay. Uh, one thing I would like to tell everybody is people are asking what is TRPV1, et cetera. Don't worry. Biologists give these little names to all these things. They're just some names. You know, I am Arnav, she's Simran. The receptor has some name. Don't worry about what is it. These are, these are not, uh, nobody's going to ask you an exam. What is TRPV1? Important to know what does it do? Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, let's see if there are more messages here. Ah, here is an interesting question which has come. Uh, in leprosy, there is a loss of the sensation of touch. Uh, has any work been done on trying to connect these sensors for touch to cures for leprosy or understanding why leprosy happens, etc.? Uh, that's a good question. I'm going to very good question. Yeah, search for uh, that myself. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that, um, but uh, I'll search for it. And oh, uh, this reminds me. Um, I forgot to mention this earlier, but on seventh December, uh, the people whose work I talked about, David Julius and Adam uh, Pataputin, they are giving their Nobel lectures. Um, and it is uh, it is going to be streamed on YouTube just like this talk, and anybody can attend it. So I, if you if you are interested in their work, I really recommend that you watch these lectures on seven December. Okay. And uh, I believe they will be in the evening in India. It's, at, it's uh, the Nobel lectures are at uh, 2 p.m. in Stockholm. Uh, and 2 p.m. in Stockholm should be uh, sometime, I guess, uh, 6.30 in the evening in India. Uh, it's the time for these lectures. Uh, on 7th, uh, it's correct, next week. Next week, the prizes will be given and uh, there will be the Nobel lectures, yes. Uh, thanks for reminding us of that. Uh, let us see if there's any more. Uh, okay, oh, one question was what you talked about the dorsal root ganglion, what does it do? Uh, um, so this is, you can, um, so all the neurons that are coming from our skin, they, they are taking information from our skin. They have to go to the central nervous system, right? Because that is where information uh, gets processed and then we act on it by moving our muscles, etc. cetera. Uh, so dorsal root ganglion is, um, 
Okay, so let me go back to how a neuron looks. Uh, my slides are stuck. Okay, okay, here. Okay, so uh, the pink colored thing, that's a neuron. Uh, so one uh, uh, extreme of this neuron, which is this one is in our skin. Uh, and the other extreme is uh, somewhere in the central nervous system. But the, the cell body where the nucleus is, uh, where the mRNA gets made, where mitochondria, all the cell organelles are, the cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion. Um, so I'll go back to that other figure. So think of dorsal root ganglion as um, the place where all these neurons can be found in one place uh, as, a, as a bundle. And uh, this is amazing because now you can just take this one small part where all the cell bodies are, where all the mRNA is, all the uh, 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 cell machinery is, and you can uh, use that to understand about sensory neurons. Okay, so it's a place where all these things come together. It's easier to just get it from there than to hunt, hunt for the different neurons in different places. All the neurons come together at this dorsal root ganglion. Yeah, all the sensory neurons. It's the sensory neurons. All right, lovely. Okay, so any more questions? We are already past 12 o'clock. So uh, let's see if anybody wants to ask a question, price chat, put out a question. We we'll, can do that. Uh, uh, if not, uh, uh, we will uh, thank... Uh, uh, we will, of course, thank uh, Simran once again. Let me remind you of the upcoming sessions. Uh, we are, I'll just replace this. Uh, we're going to be having a, a session on two weeks from now. Our third Sunday session is going to be on uh, the physics Nobel Prize. And after that, on the 26th, we will do uh, part of the physics Nobel Prize. The physics Nobel Prize is given to two rather different things. So there'll be two speakers who will cover it. And on 26th, we'll also cover part of physics and the chemistry prize as well. So stay tuned and uh, uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or if you want to like to uh, uh, get an email announcement of this, please send an email to outreach, O-U-T-R-E-A-C-H at tifr.res.in and we will add you to our uh, email list as well. Uh, okay, so um, uh, with that, I think I don't see any questions on Facebook, anything? Uh, are there any questions on Facebook? Uh, nothing on Facebook, okay. Uh, and there is uh, nothing in new on, is there anything new on Zoom? I don't, on, on... There is one question which asks, does food affect pressure sensor? Uh, okay, there is a question. Okay, yeah, there is a new chat. Does food, uh, what is it? Does... So in, in the stomach, where uh, st so the stomach also has these pizza channels and uh, uh, if the stomach becomes uh, very full, I, I, I think that's how it works. The stomach gets stretched out and that is uh, sensed by pizza channels. So yeah. Okay, good. I think we will allow people to go back and get some lunch and stretch their stomachs. Uh, on this note, uh, let me thank Simran again for taking the time to take us through this rather complex, uh, you know, uh, understanding of how pain, heat, temperature, touch, all these are so, you know, related to each other uh, through the receptors, through the nervous system. Uh, thanks a lot, Simran. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for watching. And remember, keep tuning in to Chai and Why. We are there on the first, third, and fifth Sundays of the month. Of course, this month, we have a special session on the 26th as well. So till then, please stay safe and uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you all for organizing this. Uh, Arnav Benalas and um, Sneha and Girish volunteering. Yeah, there's a lot of feedback on uh, saying that it's a nice session. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm going to end the session now. Bye-bye.